we must change our minds. Business as usual will lead to exacerbated conflict over resources and turf and eventually thermonuclear catastrophe. If the evolution of consciousness is not the way to solve the world's problems, then I don't know what it is. Well, the psychedelics were originally described as consciousness expanding drugs. That was the phenomenological description of what they were. We need to intervene in our own psyches. We cannot afford the luxury of an unconscious mind that can throw up a Hitler or a Khomeini. We cannot afford uh, the unexamined obsessive behavior pattern that leads us into a conditioned response when somebody leans on our territory or insults our racial heritage or something like that. We have to realize that it is going to take creative intellectual engineering to steer us through the, the narrow valley of being. And it's always been that way. This is what shamanism is is using plants to balance and control what is otherwise an extremely violence-prone, neurotic species. Everybody was drinking bourbon, scotch, beer, and wine. They was feeling just fine. So I go to the bar, to my bartender. I said, look, man, come on down here. gentlemen you were having a nightmare what if it's true ladies and gentlemen alan it's a possibility isn't it the very word secrecy is repugnant secrets in a free and open society and we are as a people inherently and historically opposed to secret societies the secret oaths and the secret proceedings we decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweigh the dangers constant extreme danger which are cited to justify it even today there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions even today there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger, extreme danger, that an announced need for increased security. What the hell is going on? This is Conspiracy Queries with Alan Carr. Will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit the extent that it's in my control. You're crazy. And no officials, high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes. Isn't the Pentagon suspicious that all the buildings blow up? Or to withhold from the press and the public. I think you're just looking at things for the first time. The facts they deserve to know. You've had your whole fucking life to think things over. What good's a few minutes more gonna do you now? The facts they deserve to know. They deserve to know. Deserve to know. to know. Hey, you're listening to Green Crush Conspiracy Queries, episode 117 and 45. Here we go. Facts they deserve to know. 
Okay, welcome to Green Crush Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. It's another show, another fine summer day, and uh, we'll get right to it. We have some news, and we have a guest, and uh, that's how we do things here. And then we squeeze a little bit of news on afterwards. My name is Alan Park. I'm a stage four cancer kind of guy, supposed to have been killed already by this disease. Uh, which they offered no respite from at the hospital system here in a very major city, Toronto. Said you don't have any choices. You're just going to have to take this drug and go away and die somewhere. I had my choice of where, so that's nice. But uh, I didn't uh, I didn't feel like taking them up on what they were saying, that there were no options and that I had nothing else I could do. I didn't believe that basically the same bunch of people that would sell us a camel cigarette and tell us it's the best kind of cigarette I know that's not really fair to point out where they've lied in the past to make your case for lying in the present I know it's not fair that's okay I don't care what what anybody thinks about that it's still my journey it's still what happened to me so um anyway then I came down to this studio and had an interview on Ron Mike Richards and next thing you know we, we're doing this show now. And uh, there we go. There was a buzz there that I don't like. Something to do with electricity. How strange. Anyway, Green Crush is... Uh, the green is the cannabis, and the crush is what it can do to cancer and other illnesses if used properly, like the tool that it is instead of run away from, like the tools that tell you it's dangerous. Oh. Oh. I just promoted the show and the cause of the show on YouTube. And you're still listening to me? Well, we're getting ready to migrate on over when the hammer comes down. You're not allowed to talk about how healthy it is. You can't, can't be using the truth on some of these channels. No good. <laughs> so instead, I don't have my facts before me. But uh, if, we, if we lose you... In the next little week or so. Now, I noticed the ConQ page didn't get posted last week for some reason. Um, I don't know why that is, but we did post a show, so I guess we'll be posting two shows this week. This one and the one we did last week. Anyway, let's get on to the show here. We do have a guest once again. Uh, this gentleman hails from, uh, it's hard to say where he hails from, New Jersey, I think, but he's all over the states. He's a mixologist, and you have to be careful how you pronounce that word these days. You don't want to call him something else. This is just, that's no good. Uh, he's a mixologist and a chef, and uh, he writes. He's got books out. He's also known as the Cocktail Whisperer. His name is Warren Bobro. He's a freelance mixologist. Isn't that the best kind of be? specializing in craft spirits okay here we go he's developed bar programs and implemented their cocktail and ice programs warren served as master mixologist for several brands of liquor including the busted barrel rum produced by new jersey's first licensed distillery since prohibition in new jersey i guess they mean he's from new jersey morriston or morristown We'll have to find out if that's a burning question or not. He attended Westmont Montessori School and Gill St. Bernard's School before graduating from Morristown Beard School. Now, I don't know what that means. A beard school? Well, it's the area, right? It must be. I mean, it's not a school where you learn how to become a beard. Then he completed his bachelor's degree in communications and film at Emerson in Boston. 33 years ago, he worked as a dishwasher pot scrubber. So well, there's something I have in common with him. I've also done that at York Harbor, Maine, and as a television engineer. And then he's, uh, he's, uh, he's now working at, uh, he worked for Maine Public Broadcasting in Portland, Maine. 
Uh, I was working at the Portland Maine PBS station. And he's currently, this is why we have him on, he's currently a cannabis alchemist, presently working on the periphery of known and the unknown universe between craft spirits and the cannabis industry. So this is a guy who is probably 11 times uh, illegal in Canada, the way they have things set up here. He's, uh, he's infusing alcohol with cannabis. We'll find out that uh, he studied at the Johnson & Wales University, taking culinary arts, hoping to pass a place in Charleston, South Carolina. They were the first manufacturer of fresh pasta until Hurricane Hugo devastated the place. Returned to school after a 20-year career in private banking. Private banking and washing dishes. Yeah, it's incredible. So I'm just at the one part there. I'm at the, uh, <laughs> I'm at the washing dishes part. I'm not doing the private banking part. Believe me. No such clue. Anyway, Warren is going to be on shortly. Um, he's not new to the trend of cannabis. He says he's been smoking marijuana since he was 13, and he's 57 now, I think, and he's experimented with putting it in food. A banker for 20 years moved on to becoming a notable person in the cocktail world with four books about cocktails. Then in 2012, he read about a cannabis-infused dinner at Roberta's in New York City and noticed that the food had cannabis in it, but no one put anything in the drinks. So that was Warren's mission right there. He became the Cocktail Whisperer. You can check out CocktailWhisperer.com to find out more about Warren. Let's move on into... Uh, well, there's been... Uh, there's been some more news coming out lately about how terrible cannabis is for the brain. I noticed that those stories are coming out at around the same time uh, of the same similar stories about the brain, but about how good it is. Specifically, the Alzheimer's protein gets a, apparently severely damaged to the point of non-existence with uh, THC, a dangerous little thing they like to scare you with. So uh, let's let's move on. Let's move on to medical marijuana can save lives. Here's the evidence. What evidence? Yeah. Now this was in the New York Times, and I'm rounding this up from Scoop It Scoop dot It. Jeff Sessions, yeah, he's kind of out of out of touch, that guy. But anyway, um, Sessions has it that the uh, that uh, a, a discussion of the opioid epidemic uh, needs to, you know, it points to going after marijuana. He's got to get rid of the marijuana, you see, to eliminate the opioid epidemic. Sessions suggesting that addictive pain medication wasn't the only problem and that many heroin addicts start out with marijuana and other drugs. There's a relationship between cannabis and opioids, but Sessions has it backward. Marijuana isn't a gateway drug to opioid addiction. It's a safer alternative to pain meds. Sessions vow to crack down on marijuana will only make the opioid epidemic worse. And we've been finding out lately over time how Sessions, uh, uh, there's so much news going on right now in the States, my goodness, under the Trump administration, but trying to keep it as limited to the, the purview of the show as possible. Okay, so I know there are other things at hand, but this is a cannabis news and rights show, so we're going to talk more about Sessions right now than Trump, I guess, but... Uh, you know, why are they doing this? We're always told that uh, the promotion of pharmaceutical drugs is far more reasonable and even-handed, and uh, we just don't even take in the statistics of how dangerous they can be and are. We don't look at that. We don't look at the increase in prescription drug prices uh, going up higher than any other category of health spending. We don't look at that. We think it's nuts when people 
suspect a pharmaceutical company of gaming the system. Why is that? Why do you figure that that, uh, it's unreasonable to assume that people who have done horrible things to profit in the past wouldn't do the same thing now? Why is that so odd? And, you know, this is where you fall into the conspiracy category. I mean, you're saying, wait a minute, what you're saying, wait a minute, hang on, hang on. What you're saying is this easy-to-grow, healthful plant can remedy so many of these terrible, physical, painful problems that we have for hardly anything, and people can grow that in their own homes? Well, we're going to have to... We're going to have to say no to that and throw down a bunch of laws and tell people that it's bad for their brains. Meanwhile, the evidence is now coming in, has been coming in, that THC, the dreaded demon molecule, oh my God, can actually kill the proteins that cause Alzheimer's. Yeah, I've already said that on the show. But where are you hearing it elsewhere? (laughs) Nowhere. They only talk about the things they want to talk about. Listen to this story from FiercePharma.com this January. Alex Azar's job hop from drug maker Eli Lilly to the Trump administration reflects ever-deepening ties between the pharmaceutical industry and the federal government. We already know this. We saw this with Obama. We've seen it with every president. A Kaiser Health News analysis shows that hundreds of people have glided through the revolving door that connects the drug industry to Capitol Hill and to the Department of Health and Human Services. So what they do is they go in there and they learn everything about government that could possibly get in the way, whether it's health-related, regulatory, uh, any kind of amounts, any kind of tests. And they work to bury those negative results uh, with money. And They call these folks lobbyists. And then the lobbyists come in and tell these uh, clowns, of which there are up to four or five lobbyists per elected member of Congress. So what's that, like 1,600 people almost? With big wallets telling people, here's how it's going to go from now on. And you don't think people of that mindset can be questioned when they trot out another flu vaccine? (laughs) Seriously, you're clinging to that position. Oh, yeah, well, they wouldn't, you know, I mean, everything else is screwed up, but they wouldn't do this to us. These people would pump their garbage bilge into the rivers and the streams. And they would get away for it, from it, with it, constantly. Whereas if you were caught throwing one bag of garbage in there, there'd be a ticket in your hands at the very least before you left the dock area. But these folks... They get set up in government. They understand how it works. They change laws that will make it more favorable for corporations. Then they go back to the corporation and work there again and profit from the laws that they changed. And if you're good at it, you can do it more than two, three, four times back and forth. Former congressional staffers who now work for drug companies return to the Hill to lobby former co-workers or employees. The deep ties raise concerns that there should be a fucking investigation. A full-on, 100% dive-down investigation into all of these structural systems that we uh, enslave ourselves underneath of. Okay, so we have the drug industry needs an audit. Telling us opioids are going to be fine and dandy in 2000 and none of the addiction problems that we now have. If that were cannabis back then and they said that and anybody was near the numbers, these people would be in jail right now. 
but the money's flying around. So that's what they do. They wield undue influence over drug-related legislation and or government policy from one side and then the other, and then back to one and then back to the other. Pharma guy says, I'd like to say one or two words about what I call the pharma government complex, which is the collusion between the pharmaceutical industry, lawmakers, and government agencies. Now, they're looking for collusion between Russia and electing the Trump government. There may be some there. Some people are running around as though they haven't found anything of that nature. And the people that say they've found it don't seem to have much to wave around. But it could be there. But there's definitely collusion between the pharmaceutical industry and the lawmakers who have profited from financial contributions from the industry. It goes on here, as well as help from the industry hired guns, the lobbyists, to craft laws benefiting the drug industry. Obviously, my efforts and the efforts of many others to shine a light on this has achieved nothing. See, they have the collusion. They've got evidence of it. Your child already may be a result of it. So might your diminished income. And yet, nothing happens. And meanwhile, they're chasing collusion and trying to find evidence of collusion for something else. What's going to happen when they get that? Nothing. More means of control. So those hired guns craft laws benefiting the drug industry. And his efforts and the efforts of many others to shine a light on that has achieved nothing. The amount spent on lobbying during the first nine months of Trump's presidency, reports the Center for Responsive Politics, was higher than in any corresponding period since 2012. The article there was, The D.C. Pharma Lobbying Swamp is bigger and more slimy than ever. So between that and between the opioids being dangerous to the point of people dying and even more dangerous to the point of people denying that cannabis can end that situation, they choose to kvetch and moan about, what about the children? And children are not even using the smoking as much as they used to. Young people choosing marijuana over an alcohol and cigarettes, but they're less interested in smoking it taking it in different ways, vaping it, eating it, infusing it. And yet these folks come up with these studies. Here's one from June 4th. New research investigating the effects of heavy cannabis use on cognitive functioning in adolescents and young adults is four, has found little to no long-term harm. Yet we tolerate and accept without question the notion that cannabis should not be consumed by anybody under 25, absent any questioning why we feel it's okay to send military-trained 18-year-olds off to face mayhem and death. <laughs> or that teenage brains are the most malleable and regenerative. But by all means, make up your crazy laws. Medical pot legalization results in an average of a 10% reduction in traffic fatalities wow this was published in the journal of law and economics in 2013 to date 16 states at that point had passed medical marijuana laws yet very little is known about their effects so they say using state level data we examine the relationship between medical marijuana laws and a variety of outcomes legalization of medical marijuana is associated with increased use of marijuana among adults but not among minors in addition legalization is associated with a nearly nine percent decrease in traffic fatalities most likely due to its impact on alcohol consumption our estimates provide strong evidence that marijuana and alcohol are substitutes Amazing. This from December 20th, 2016. States with med marijuana laws have fewer traffic fatalities. You'd think it would be higher. 
but researchers at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health found an 11% reduction in traffic fatalities on average when examining places that have enacted medical marijuana laws. The presence of medical marijuana dispensaries also correlated with fewer traffic fatalities. And what do we got here? Cops going to try to arrest you for it. Meanwhile, how about this just before we get to our illustrious guest? This is in... Uh, NationalInstituteOfHealth.gov Assessment of cannabinoids, agonist and antagonist in invasion potential of K562 cancer cells. It's a kind of cancer. The prominent hallmark, this is the background of malignancies. This is a metastatic, meta, I should be able to say this pretty well, metastatic spread of cancer cells. Recent studies have reported the nature of invasive cells could be changed after this phenomenon causing chemotherapy resistance. It's been demonstrated that the upregulated expression of matrix metalloproteinase as a metastasis biomarker can fortify the metastatic potential of leukemia. I'll get to the uh, conclusion in a second here. Furthermore, investigations have confirmed the inhibitory effect of cannabinoid and endocannabinoid on the proliferation of cancer cells in vivo and in vitro. Conclusion. Our findings clarifies that CB1 receptors, also known as cannabinoid receptors in the body, system number one, in your body that you already got when you were born, which already makes small amounts of DMT. This body, it's responsible for the anti-invasive effects in the K562 cell lines. There's another piece of piece of science there telling you that cancer and cannabis are not very good friends. So let's um do to one killing the other. All right, so let me get uh, our guest on the phone. Here's Warren. Let me give him a call here. Do 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 do. And we will get Warren on the phone. Hello. Warren, Bobro, how are you today? This is. I am fantastic. Fantastic. I just muted my uh, computer, so uh, there won't be any echo. Okay. Thank you for doing that. How are you today? Where are you today? Are you, uh, <laughs> you were bobbing uh, around all over I'm the place. Si uh, <laughs> well, that's what I like to be doing. Um, I'm sitting at my desk. Okay. Well, it seems like you've got a handle Morristown, on that. Morristown, New Jersey. Okay. Morristown. That's where you were born. You're a hometown boy, are you? I'm a hometown boy, and uh, no one knows me here. It's remarkable. That's good. Okay. Well, let's let's find out why no one knows you there. It's a good place to kind of hide out, I guess, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, because they don't be every place. <laughs> you leave your oh, celebrity. Yeah, there you go. Leave your celebrity behind for a little bit. So, uh, yeah. so. So, Warren, when, when we spoke on the phone the other day, you said something rather interesting to me, and we'll tell the folks who you are. I've already uh, announced you as the cocktail whisperer, author of many books, and mixologist, which I was very careful to pronounce correctly. Um, you did okay. You, you need to do mixologist. You are a mixologist, and nothing else that starts with an M and ends with an ist. Uh, so, <laughs> so you, uh, you were, you were a drinker, uh, so to speak. Now you and I, this is interesting here because you and I come at this from a different angle because I don't, I don't all that often participate in, uh, for, for cancer related reasons. I stopped what I would call my usual intake of, uh, of alcohol some time ago, but I'm very fascinated right. in, in, in what you're getting to. But before we get into some of the cool questions, like I really am interested in, uh, there's a lot of, uh, um, you know, people that have a problem mixing the two elements, et cetera, particularly when you're driving. Yeah. Of course, that's the case. But yeah, since you're an expert, <laughs> let's hear all about it. But I blame all this on well, Montessori. Have... I blame it all on Montessori. Oh, it, it, was, the op it was the open classroom, I know. And, <laughs> and, you know, they maybe if I had a little more direction in my life from an early age. You know, I grew up on a farm and things were I was very sheltered and, and things probably could have been a lot harder on me. But, you know, it was a... Uh, it was an upbringing like like no one else's that I that I've ever come across. And you know, my dad was an international tax lawyer, and my mom took care of her horses. And uh, you know, and I took care of uh, scooping uh, you know the stuff that horses make. Oh, 
<laughs> lots of lots of that. So you know, I, I mean, my you know, we traveled extensively growing up, and uh, I guess the first you know time I really was uh, introduced to cannabis was probably from my uncle who uh, was a hip. You know, he was I mean, a what? He, sorry, he, he graduated from. He was a hippie. He graduated oh. from college in 1969, so that put him right in there right. with uh, with all those uh, all those darn hippies. Right. So uh, <laughs> you know that's that's where I that's where I smoked weed for the first time. With your grandfather? No, not my my uncle. Oh, my uncle, your not uncle. my grandfather. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, my uncle. My my, uncle. my grandfather was very my my grandfather was very conservative. He wouldn't have had that uh, that conversation. <laughs> Fair enough. So so you didn't you didn't do this with your dad though? Was your was it your dad's brother? Or your mom? Uh, my no, my mom's brother. My uh, my father never had a brother. He only had a sister, right? and he was uh, he was very difficult. My father was very difficult. Okay. Um, he did not he did not approve of me using cannabis, and he disowned me for it. So. Oh wow! Yeah. Oh gee, yep. sorry yep. about that. Yeah, so, well, that's that's no, I am actually that's part of the uh, magic of uh, of being an author is no matter what someone does to you, you can uh, make them live in infamy by dedicating books to them and. So I dedicated cannabis cocktails to him. I said to my father, Robert Bobro, who taught me to stand on my own two feet and succeed at what made me happy. Oh, so, right. uh, you know, that's that's how you take a, a bad situation and you turn it into something that it's, ad, you know, you take the power away from a dead person. Right. And, uh, you know, so I, I've done that and I've been able to look back at that and say I made the right decision by dedicating the book to him because he was unable to see that I really had healing in mind. I wasn't looking for a recreational book, and I re certainly, certainly, wasn't looking for a get high quick book. So right. I think that's really important to uh, to make that differentiation. And he never got the chance to see your book, I guess. Uh, no. In the last two or three months of his life was, were uh, it with in the complete knowledge that I would never talk to him again. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's unfortunate. But uh, anyway, so um, we all, uh, that's a great example. I, I've heard this before that, uh, you know, every every person in that category is uh, someone you look up to or supposed to look up to will teach you by example somehow or other. And it's not always. Yeah, and, and not whether, and it's not always the lesson that you want to learn. Right. You know, it's a lesson that, that it's, it's more difficult. And I, and I, you know, he knew who I was from an early age, and he certainly knew that I smoked marijuana and, you know, or cannabis or whatever you want to call it. You know, and, and that wasn't going to change. You know, yeah. that certainly wasn't going to change. And it was something that I've done for so long that, and probably my stability in life, I believe, is because I, I use cannabis products and I, and it, it's made me a, a calmer, more peaceful person. And, and that's just who I am as a man. And, you know, you get to be a certain age and you say, yeah, I know I look 41, but I'm really 57 years old and I've had a lot of experiences, not all of them good. And uh, but they brought me here. And hopefully, you know, the book Cannabis Cocktails was meant as a uh, as a method of healing. And, and, it, and the, my methods really are, are, are not so new. They really go back to the mid 1800s when, you know, there wasn't great refrigeration and certainly there wasn't electricity to keep things cool. So alcohol and cannabis certainly were used as a tincture. And, you know, who knows, knows what your uh, your apothecary was doing with it. But I think he was probably making very basic cocktails and using cannabis. And we know this is true because I visited the. Uh, the Apothecary Museum down in New Orleans when they were doing a, uh, a, a presentation on cannabis in the early apothecary. And they had done all the research. So my job was easy. I knew that they were, that they were infusing THC and not hemp, but THC into craft spirits. I took it to the next step and wrote a book about it. And when was that that you discovered this? Uh, I'd say it was about 2015. They, they did a, uh, a presentation at the uh, at the you know apothecary at the old uh, pharmacy museum in New Orleans. Okay. All right, now let, let me ask you a, a couple of questions because I'm coming at it from a person sure. that, that I don't really know much about alcohol. So any question I have will be okay. will be genuine uh, curiosity and yeah. or ignorance as opposed to trying to trip you up. Um, alcohol alcohol as I've known it is a uh, technically speaking it's a depressant. No? 
Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, it is. Absolutely. So that doesn't mean that you're going to be all bummed out or whatever if you use it properly, right? No, Once again, no, it's a it, tool. It's just, what, what, it's, you know, I always say everything in moderation. And I know you know, originally when I wrote the book, we kind of went hog wild on some of the uh, – some of the potencies of, of these of the craft cocktails and, and i must admit that they, they were i really had very little idea how strong the drinks were and they they were extraordinarily strong but we've really ratcheted back the uh the amount of cannabis that's in the drinks and, it, and it's more of a of a microdose now instead of a, of an overdose oh. so well, uh, what was know, the overdose I, I, I just, you know, what was the you overdose know, the that overdose was too high was, the overdose was from the was from the cannabis. It was certainly wasn't from the alcohol sure. because I wasn't putting very much alcohol in. But it was it was this crossfade that not everyone is is accustomed to, and it's a uh, it can be an overwhelming experience. But in that case, we recommend uh, lemon juice and peppercorns together. The terpenes in the lemon juice uh, and yeah. the peppercorns are, counteract those terpenes in the cannabis. And it's just almost instantaneous. You come off of the stuff and no, no more pesky hospital trips or, uh, you know, throwing up in front of friends and family. You know, that should never happen. So what, what kind of dosages were we, were we uh, getting that kind of reaction from? Were... Uh, well, since I tested all the recipes on myself, I was doing like 150 milligram cocktails. Oh, and wow. those are just way out of line. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I have an incredibly high uh, tolerance, but... Uh, you know, I, I still feel that that if someone was doing, you know, looking at the book recreationally, they they would they could be in trouble. From a medicinal standpoint, probably not. You know, I have glaucoma, and I'm looking to reduce the interocular pressure behind my eyes, and I'm not. I don't want to take eye drops, and I want to just, you know, sometimes I want to mix, uh, you know, infuse THC into mezcal and make something, you know, with with Pickett's ginger beer or. You know something really exciting in that in, in that realm, and and you know I live in a part of New Jersey that's incredibly conservative, and the smell of cannabis in the air is guaranteed to get you arrested oh, even really? if you have a cannabis card like I do. You know, I mean, it's at least going to get the attention of the local police. I don't want that. You know, I was in L.A. over the weekend. I flew out to look at uh, Bloom, which is a uh, they make beautiful, just you know, world class cannabis oil. Uh, in five ten cartridges and all sorts of things, and you know when you walk around the streets in L.A. smoking a joint, no one pays any any attention. I mean, they're looking for real crime. They're not looking for someone smoking weed in the street. So around here in New Jersey, it's just the opposite. And if a policeman was to walk walk past you or drive past you and they smelled it, you know you're you're looking for some serious trouble, and uh, and certainly you'll be entered into the system. And I don't need that. So that's why I, you know when I think about being the person that I am and, and who I've become certainly in, in the, in, you know, in the, in the legal or illegal standpoint, I want to just, I want to just put it right out there. I, I don't want anyone really to know my business. So that's why I wrote the book. And, and the other reason why I wrote the book was during uh, Giuliani's uh, administration, I was picked up for smoking a joint in New York city and I never want to go through that again. Oh and that was God. a, uh, that should, that should have never happened to anyone. And they took me out of commission for 48 hours without charges, without a phone call, without anything. Wow. They helped me in Rikers. Because you were literally... And that was no fair. You were just... No fair. Literally smoking... I, I was smoking... I had just been up in Vancouver, and I brought some BC Bud back with me. You know, I mean, everyone slipped a joint into their jacket, and I did too. And uh, I lit it up in the street, and they said they smelled it two blocks away. You know, that it had that green crack smell. Right. Really, really, really intense. <laughs> and so... It seemed like 20 policemen came down on me. And, you know, I had probably as much weed as what would fit on my fingernail, and I have tiny hands. <laughs> so, wow. you know, it was really, really, really bad. And, you know, I mean, what, what was I going to do? Say, say, please don't arrest me, officer. I, you know, and, but, you know what are they going to do? They had to do it, so they did it. Wow. And, and that's why I wrote the book. I mean, I wrote the book because I want people to be able to take their medicine and not have anyone know what they're doing. Oh, that's amazing. That's fantastic. What a great way to get going. So, but first of all, you, you became, uh, I, I lost the plot here. You were dishwashing and then you were a banker. Yeah, I was dishwashing. <laughs> no, no, I was dishwashing. Then I became a chef Then I went to culinary school. Then I did the ATF apprenticeship. Then I opened a fresh pasta company. I, I cooked around the United States. I lost, you know, I lost my business. I cooked around the United States. 
it was not sustainable. I mean, physically not sustainable. It was a tough time. You know, I was, it was like the early 1990s and food has had not exploded yet like it had today. Right. So I was working in a business, not being able to afford to live in New York City, certainly. I was working in a restaurant in New York City. And it was just, it was just not sustainable at all. So um, I was helping my dad out in his law office, which was doomed. For, you know, I wasn't going to become a lawyer. And uh, he suggested, since I owed him $75,000 for losing it in my pasta company, um, he suggested me getting a real job. And for 20 years, I paid it. You know, it took me 20 years to pay it off. And wow. the day that I was able to pay it off, I was the last day I worked in the corporate world. Wow. Amazing. So, so it's not I started, a... the, I started at the bottom and I worked my way up. You know, yeah. That's, that's what I did. That's what I've always done. And and then you, oh, when you were learning about, um, you know, I mean, okay, put it this way. When I was saying to you that I don't know much about alcohol, so there are a lot of different drinks. There's mm -hmm. your, your rusty nails and your, you know, your tequilas. Sure. There's your various lineups of shots, sex on the beach, yeah, all that kind of thing. I'm not, no, 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 no. I don't do drinks like that. Mine are unique. I am a mixologist. I create my own, my own craft cocktails using craft spirits. You're never going to see... I mean, very, very rarely do I have anything that's that's even moderately sweet. My drinks are savories. They're they're definitely complex, but they're not complicated. And I, I think it's really, really important to differentiate between those, you know, B-52s that we used to do shooters of or, uh, you know, Long Island iced tea. No, I, I don't do things like that. Mine are incredibly sophisticated. But that's what I mean, the though. Using spirits I, I... that money can buy. I mean, but, but really, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you, you, what you were discussing was, was the kind of the seedy underbelly of the mixology business, but I'm really at the top of the house. And not just me saying that. I would never have six books in print if it wasn't for the fact that my stuff is, is really unique, you know? Right. Well, the, the reason I'm so, asking isn't, isn't that I was inferring that you were doing that. I was just saying that that is, <laughs> that, that is generally the scope of those kinds of drinks that we all get into. Uh, we do those shooters at yeah, the maybe, bars. We chase down with maybe, tequilas. Maybe, but no, but no, no, no. I, I, I want to I wanna say, you know, I'm involved with another whole group. And, and you know, that, that, that high volume, um, you know, bad ingredients. Yeah, I know that goes on, but I've never worked in that. I've only worked in the in the white tablecloth, high, you know, uh, handcrafted. And why the book doesn't have anything, you know, any like big names in it. It's all small producer, you know, craft spirits. And I find it very important if you're going to use any sort of heating techniques, you're not going to want to have anything that's caramel colored or added sugar or glycerin added because it's really going to change the chemical makeup of the alcohol. And someone could get sick, and I, I don't want that. Yeah. So I use you know, craft spirits that have not been – they haven't been manipulated. And, and that's so important that they're not you know, attacked by, uh, by methods that are unclean. And, and you know, I'm never going to have this as something legal because I am changing the recipes of, of the spirits. And, of course, the uh, organization that monitors that in the United States called the TTB, I'm sure they frown upon that. But, oh, sure, uh, you yeah. know, I'm not doing it in bars, and uh, I, I do it for private events occasionally. You might read about it afterwards, certainly never before. Um, we try to vet our, our guest list to thoroughly. You. I don't want any trouble. Um, this is not something that we take uh, lightly. I feel very honored to be in the place of healing. Um, it kind of goes back to, uh, to things that I knew from my own family, you know, they, they were in the quote unquote snake oil business. So I want to be very careful and very right. cognizant of not, not doing that, not yeah. having that, that stigma. So, but you when you... I really believe the cannabis heals, I mean, I truly believe the cannabis heals and that's, that's where I'm at. So yeah. when you, when you have a certain kind of uh, drink, I mean, what I mean is you turn yeah. the whole thing on its ear. You, you came across all those sweeter drinks and those kind of ritualized drinks. Yeah, of course. Drinks of course. and you went, no, hang on. I was, but, but I was never working with them. And, and, when, and my first uh, three cocktail books, uh, Apothecary Cocktails, Whiskey Cocktails, and Bitters and Shrub Syrup Cocktails, those were not, uh, those were not sweet cocktail books. And I'd, I'd be very hard-pressed to find anything in there that was sweet. The only time I did anything that was remotely sweet was in cannabis cocktails. But I, I love working with chocolate, so I was able to do bittersweet chocolate as opposed to 
you know, sugary sweet chocolate. I think there's one drink, you know, about, uh, uh, let's see if I can find the book. I, I don't have it here. Where's my book? It's someplace around my, my office. Oh, there it is. Uh, but there, there's some, you know, some drinks in it that, that could be perceived as sweet, but I really don't believe that they are. You know, oh, here, no one can talk to a horse, of course. It has chocolate syrup, cannabis infused whiskey, uh, chocolate liqueur, whipped cream, and bittersweet chocolate shavings and ice. Oh, so it, it really is a it's a it's a bourbon chocolate, you know it's bittersweet chocolate as fresh whipped cream, uh, really good quality chocolate syrup, only two ounces of it. So it's it's you know it's not an awful vodka based concoction. It's a bourbon you know bourbon dream that's really sophisticated. Wow, that sounds amazing. So, that sounds really good. So yeah, you get to play, right? But, you get to play but, with different combos. Yeah, absolutely. But, Oh, of course. I mean, the the one that I, you know, you were saying you don't drink. I would recommend the cannabis infused condensed milk with Vietnamese iced coffee. You know, mm. we all love Vietnamese iced coffee. It's so it's so slippery, and the chicory is kind of bitter, and you know the the coffee is very very strong espresso, and then you cut it with this unctuous, sweet, uh, but not too sweet, uh, you know, condensed milk that's been simmered with uh with decarbed cannabis and, and i've been decarbing my cannabis in a device called the ardent lift and what that does is it brings the cannabis to 100 percent bioavailability so it makes me look like a star every single time because you know i i don't have i'm not burning up my batches in the toaster oven anymore like everyone used to do all the time or you know if you're using a rice cooker sometimes they get off temperature and then you you know the thing is boiling and all your thc is evaporated oh, so wow, nice. you know there's a there's a lot of little techniques that we do and and you know i in the book of course i teach you how to do it the old-fashioned slow way using an oven and a closed container but you know when i'm out in the field and doing you know events i want to make sure that it works perfectly every time so i use the ardent lift and i use the magical butter machine just two pieces of machinery that, that make me look like a pro every single time. And of course, when someone's paying you, you know, a pretty penny to do an event, you want to make sure that everyone gets stoned. So Absolutely. there's just no messing around, you know? Wow. That's great. I'm just looking at that now. The, uh, the, uh, ardent herbal lift. Yes. The ardent lift. Yes. Yeah. I love that thing. And I spoke about them at South by Southwest this year, disruptive technology in your home cannabis kitchen. That just makes it great for everyone, you know. I mean, I used to decarb, and yeah, it, it was difficult, you know. I mean, you had to make sure yeah, that you didn't go you too were, hot for too burning long. Burning up batches, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're burning, burning up batches, and uh, and then some. You know, if you're looking to get more CBD or CBD, CBGD or whatever they are, I don't know. I don't. I don't. I'm not a doctor, but uh, but I will say that some of them are revealed at higher temperatures. Some of the the you know, feelings are revealed at lower temperatures. Then, of course, there's all those important terpenes. Right. Uh, the Bloom product that I visited this weekend, you know, they preserve these incredible terpenes. It's like thrusting your face into a, oh, you know, wow. a bowl of fruit. It's just incredible. I mean, I'd never smelled anything like it. I thought that they'd been, they did something artificial, and then I learned it was all natural, and it was like, wow. <laughs> you know? Even better. So, yeah. Even better. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm the lucky guy. I truly am the lucky guy because I, I must say, you know, I was a banker. I hated my life. Every day was a drag. I didn't know what I was going to be when I grew up. I was only trying to please my father and grandfather who hated me anyway. And they put their money where their mouth was and, and, you know, cut me off forever. So I had to become something that was good and, and follow my dreams and be, be something that was different. And that's what I what I think I've achieved. And you know, no one said I was going to be rich and famous. I, I'd be happy with just just famous, rich. You know, who, you know, money comes and goes. But uh, but just being recognized for my craft and being the person that wrote the first book about mixing cannabis and cocktails. You know, that's all I ever wanted. I don't want anything else. Yeah, we we were thinking of you uh, a while ago. There was <laughs> we knew you were coming on the show, and an article came yeah. out in the Canadian publication saying that uh, some Canadian company is going to infuse an alcoholic beverage with cannabis. Yeah. Constellation. Won't Constellation. Won't this be exciting as the first time it's ever happened? I mean, that's what was in the article. Yeah, no, it's, no, it's not the first time it's ever <laughs> no, happened. Sure I contacted not. them and I said, you know, I really am the first person to do it on a commercial scale. I know bartenders have been playing around with it, and I'm happy that they have. 
but you know, I, I've been able to standardize the recipe. And there's and actually I've taken it even further than the than the standard recipe. I mean, the book was great and I'm happy that I wrote it, but I'm doing stuff that is just so far beyond what was in the book. You know, with nitrous oxide now, people are using CO2 in the marketplace. And I'm saying, no, no, all you need is this ISI, which is the thing that makes whipped cream. And you once you take your decarbed cannabis and you add, put it in the, the ISI with whatever uh, craft spirit you have, hit it with two uh, jolts of uh, nitrous oxide. And then I activate the, uh, the THC with just, you know, in the magical butter machine, 160 degrees for about two hours. And you have the finest craft spirits that money can buy, completely packed full of THC, and it's uh, everyone's going to get off. <laughs> you know? Wow. So, well, all I can say is, I did. You know, maybe I didn't invent the science, but I have made the science better. Yeah, you're. It's well suited to your skill set. <laughs> well, yeah, and 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 my skill set is as a mixologist, and I have to be straight out about that. And I'm not a big drinker anymore. And a lot of it has to do with health. I mean, really, I mean, there's there's all sorts of it's it's not a, a safe and sane material for me to be working with. So I decided to follow my dreams, do what I love, listen to my heart and do, you know, go forward. And that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Hey, so uh, this is a bit of a, a drag to bring up, but we just lost Anthony Bourdain. Uh, and yes, uh, yes, you, yes. You, you did an interview with him regarding scotch. Four yeah, questions about scotch yeah, on scotch uh, wildriverreview.com. Yeah. Tell us about what it was like uh, uh -huh. talking with him. I mean, he, he's a... Uh... Oh, he, he was a, he's a very, very interesting guy. And I, I felt that, that he was... Well, let's see how I can put this in a, in a, in a, in a way that's, that seems reasonable. I felt that he was uncomfortable in a suit. That's what I felt he was. And when I put my arm around him to, for the photograph that I had with him, yeah. I felt that, that he, was, he, was not, he wasn't having a good day. That's what it felt like. His energy was, get me the hell out of here. I don't want to be here. You know, it was, for the, it was a luncheon for the American Crafts Council at Bernadine in New York City. And I was given the opportunity of, of asking him, I really wanted to ask him five questions, and it worked out to be four questions. Then the PR came down. I mean, they said, no, it has to be three. And I said, no, let's, let's have four. But anyway, you know, he, uh, he, he was not comfortable having any conversation other than Balvany, which was sponsoring him. Right. So I really couldn't get, get to who he was. But for a, a split second, he fell in love with my gnome. And I and I don't know, you know, how how to explain that. I carry a 1860s German drinking gnome, and I was holding him in my the gnome in my hands, and uh, and he he looked over at Klaus, that's the name of my gnome, and he smiled, and it was almost like quizzical. It, it was he was interested in knowing why I was carrying a gnome, but there wasn't enough time for him to ask that question, and I had to kind of get those get extract the information from him very quickly right. and be crisp and then let him go on to the next person. But for a split second, and I have the picture on, you know, in the, in the, you know, the piece, it shows him and myself and he looks kind of sheepish in the picture yeah. and uh, my gnome. And, you know, it was sad. And I, you know, it's, it's a tough business and there's a lot of mental issues in the business. And I, you know, when I started as a dishwasher working, I worked with a lot of people who were like PhDs and, you know, people who were, who were like professors in school and they just couldn't handle it. And they, they, they dropped out of society and they became cooks or they became dishwashers or they became like I did, a pot scrubber. And, and it's, it's, a, it's tough, you know, things are not always what they seem. And, and I always found for me, it was, uh, I had a tough time of it. You know, I may have grown up in a very privileged way, but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that I have that now. And I work very hard for what I have. And I'm completely self-made. And it's it's really a uh, – it's an honor to say that, but it's also damn frightening. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it really is because I have no one to fall back on but myself. And uh, it's not always easy to be myself, especially working in an industry such as cannabis – which has such a stigma, especially on the East Coast of the United States. The West Coast, I think they've solved that stigma a long time ago, and certainly Canada, where you're in Canada, right? Yeah, 
What about up and down yeah, okay, the middle? So it, How, it, it? In the middle, oh, it's a good play, good way of getting arrested. I, I'm just serious. <laughs> it, it's you know, I, I travel all over, and I don't want to tell you how I get things. I've I've never have any trouble finding anything. That's probably my uh, my benefit of who I am. But uh, but I will say at the end of the day that uh, there are places that I can go and places that I can't go, and I have to be careful. And you know, I mean, when I first started going down to New Orleans, it was still illegal. Now it's legal down there. Uh, New York City, of course, I have a I have that problem with New York City. So I'm happy that they're not arresting people for pot right. in New York City anymore. Yeah. Uh, New Jersey, they they still are arresting people in New Jersey. So. You know, whatever, whatever that means, it just means. And, uh, you know, I'm, I just go forward and, and hopefully that I, I can be the person in life that I want to be and, and I'm able to uh, to be successful at it. And yeah. if not, I've got to figure out what to do because I'm not a youngster anymore. <laughs> right. Well, you're, 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 but you're... I, th- I think this I think this is a good path. I really think this is a good path. Yeah, I'm, w- I'm confident it is. I, I'm really, really confident in myself. So these books that you've written that are uh, that are cookbooks now, so or not cookbooks, but you, you well, they're, they're cocktail, recipe books, they're right? Cocktail cookbooks, yeah, yeah, recipe books certainly, and they're stories and and conversations, and it's just a really uh, it's a really interesting way of uh, of looking at, at cocktail mixology. So we're gonna need I'm, a magical uh, butter. I'm, I'm pretty talented, you know. Well, of course you are. Of course you are, and and <laughs> what's amazing is there's there's not a, a hundred thousand guys like you. You know, there's a there's a very well, few people. No, no one would. No one would put up the kind of BS that I put up with for so many years. So uh, <laughs> they would say, get, get me the hell out of here. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, it, it <laughs> goes... I really uh, had no other choice. What can I do? The reviews on uh, some of your books on Amazon are great. It said, got it for my sister that's a bartender. She loves it and makes me some good damn drinks out of it. Uh Yep, yep. What an awesome book filled with yep. great ideas, methods, and insight. I've made a few of these recipes, and they're easy to follow and quite effective. Great recipes in a fun format. Enjoyed the book very much and, uh, and recommend it to home bartenders wow. looking to expand their repertoire. All kinds of great, uh, very easy to understand. Here's what I hate about cookbooks. So I, I've got to see one of yours, got to get one. Here's what I don't like about right. it. Right. There'll be, like in a food cookbook, it'll be like, um, you know, the delicious uh, stew sauce or whatever. So you go, okay, the delicious right. stew. So you start reading through, and it says you need, a, a, you, know, a, a, you know, a pound of meat and, a, you know, an onion and this mm-hmm. and that and the other. And then it'll say, then you need some, uh, some you know, fantastic super sauce for fantastic super sauce recipe. Turn to page 41. Oh, okay. So and you it's gotta, not there. Then you go to turn page 41, there's all the sauce, and you have another, you have another series of things uh, that you have to get through, right. and it says, "Oh, for this, this involves the infused uh, uh, coconut uh, meat. So for that, turn to page eighty-three, and you can never get done. Yeah, you know, it, you can never get done. You well, can't have all the staples. My, my drinks are pretty easy. I mean, the first the first couple books were a little more difficult, but I, I will honestly say that I I learned my lesson. So I wanted to just you know be really clear in the sense that I wanted it to be approachable. I wanted it to be things that people could do." And really, at the end of the day, make it something that's fun and make it something that's, that's healing. That's so important. And, and really, you know, there's, there's the other part of it is that you can really, really, really get stoned. On it. <laughs> I, I, have, I, have, I, have, I have to say, you know, it really is a wonderful feeling. And, and I don't mean to say this in, a, in an irresponsible manner. No, but there are not. great feelings. There are great feelings in life. And this is one of them. And I really, really am confident that it's uh, that it's a, that in the right dose, there's nothing that feels better. There is nothing that I have found that feels better, and that's just more approachable and uh, just friendly. So, what's what's one of your and favorite you drinks around, then? You know, what, what, say, if I like the gin oh, and tonic, what would you recommend? Is, if, is, oh, uh, oh, uh, if you like a gin and tonic, well, you know, it's it's kind of difficult for me to cut it down that that simply i have i have one drink in there that it's a uh it's a drink with rum agar coal a little bit of uh lime juice i'm putting my my bluetooth now uh it's lime juice rum agar coal and and a touch of simple syrup it's just delicious okay wow that sounds good absolutely delicious it's so simple 
It's a it's, it's a drink that's from the uh, the island of Martinique, and it's called a tea punch or a t t i p u n c h or tea punch. And it's so just so refreshing, and you you can drink it with ice or without ice. And it, and it's a fun drink to drink. And you know, two ingredients really three in a pinch, and and anyone can do it. What's that and simple really sauce the only again? Thing the simple syrup is the part that um, that uh, oh, sorry the the simple syrup is the part that's infused with the THC. Oh okay, I see. Oh that's so the, the... it's very very easy to produce. And and you would take the uh, you take the simple the the, uh, the cannabis that's been decarbed, and you add it to your simple syrup, which is one cup of sugar to one cup of water, and then you let it simmer until it gets just down to a, uh, you let it simmer so it gets, you know, nice and thick, and then it goes from there. Wow. And it's easy to, you, to use in, in your craft cocktails, and uh, and you can use it in all sorts of things. You can use it in, in a Manhattan, you can use it in a Rob Roy, you can infuse just about anything you want. Okay, so what... It's very, very easy, and, you know... Give us a rundown then on uh, some of the things we'll need. You said you had a magical butter machine. You've got this decarboxylate uh, unit that's f quite amazing, right? No, I'm still here. Sounds like you think you lost me, but maybe. Uh, no, I can hear you. I can still hear you. Hello. I can still hear you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I I I hit a I hit a dead spot. That's okay. Um. No, I'm there's, just asking. A, um, yeah, what do you need in, in the in the way of having a bag of tricks? Like you've got a magical butter machine, right? That's a particular unit that okay. makes butter, there's, and you also need this decarboxylating unit. Yes, you, you have to decarb first. That's so important. That's essential. I can't imagine doing my process without decarbing because you're not going to get the full potential of right. your cannabis. Right. So it's you, you so need that. Important. So you need to get that thing set up. You yeah. need to get one of those. Yeah, but 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 not that you don't necessarily have to buy this nearly two hundred and fifty dollar item. You can you can do it in the oven as long as you have a commercial, uh, you know what what should we call it thermometer, so you know that you have a nice even temperature. Right. You don't want to open up the oven while it's while it's decarbing to check the temperature. You can look through the glass to see it. Okay. Because when you open up the toaster oven, it's going to drop, or the regular oven, it's going to drop. You know, thirty thirty degrees. And that'll ruin your batch. Um, so you just to be cognizant, you know, you're not going to go out for a pizza while you're decarving and say, "Oh, I forgot the weed." You know? Right, right. That's that's really important, you know. Because you know, I don't I don't know where you are if it's expensive but down here in the medical system. You can't afford to make mistakes. No, you don't want so to make mistakes. I have to have science. Yeah, I have to have science that works every single time. Right. And that's my uh, my pleasure to do that. And I want to make it easy. And I want to make it approachable, and I want to make it delicious. Right, that's the selling point, right? I mean, once I mean, you're talking to people, how do you actually get going? Like, what's an event for you? How does Warren spend the night being a mixologist somewhere? What is what's involved with that? Oh my gosh! That? Well, I, uh, you know, I, I I create a cocktail menu, of course, with and I usually like pairing cocktails to different courses of food, yeah. you know, in the meal. Um, sometimes we'll have like a welcome punch and the welcome punch will have some cannabis in it. Then we would go into a, uh, maybe a whiskey or a mezcal drink to go with an appetizer, right. say a little more assertive, maybe for an entree, we could do it in a, like an infused milk punch. You know, it would go really nicely, you know, and of course the milk is infused with THC. Um, dessert would be maybe a, uh, an Amaro, which is an Italian uh, digestive, and then we could have, uh, you know, infused that as well, and then maybe finish it off with a, with a, you know, Turkish coffee with a dollop of uh, cannabis butter on top, you know, like a bulletproof coffee. Wow, nice. Wow. Have you done that? Have you have you mixed the? the oh meat? yeah, oh yeah, all, all those things. I've done all these things. Uh, I just did one very recently, and. Uh, it had, uh, I just, let's see, I, I did a uh, honey, it was a gin from Vermont called Bar Hill, and it's, it's 
defined by the reason that it's made with raw honey and grain. And I found when you add uh, THC to it, you can make things like bees knees, which is the honey and lemon and uh, THC, and it's just a beautiful little cocktail. You know, wow. simple, simple, simple. <laughs> nice to keep it simple, right? What's the most well, ridiculous? I want to make it so it's, well, the most ridiculous thing is probably like the mango lassies because they, they're just a little more difficult to make. Um, you know, they've got a little bit of Greek yogurt in them, and they have a mango, uh, uh, you know, whatchamacallit, uh, puree, and then you, you have to infuse the Greek yogurt or rum or whatever with THC, and then, you know, there's just a, there are different steps for making a mango latte. Right. But they are so delicious because they're, they're, be, they're yeah, so yeah. refreshing. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's like today, right now it's 90 degrees outside, and I wish I had one in my hand because it would be stoning and, and relaxing and fun and, and just all the things that we want to have in a uh, in a craft cocktail that just happens to be packed with enough THC to drop an entire family of elephants. <laughs> and tell us also, you're also well aware that when you mix uh, cannabis and mangoes, right, you get an extra... Right, it enhances the, the, the effect. Yeah. It makes the effect more intense. And that's probably, and I also do a a, a rose and cardamom uh, loss, but it doesn't have the, the mango loss uh, intensity now. So ma- mango is the only kind of fruit or, or substance that we know that can do this outside of the uh, the cannabis realm. That oh, we'll I actually... don't. I think uh, rhubarb. Can, I think rhubarb does it too, but it has a different effect. Mm. Rhubarb. Uh, rhubarb works for uh, for certain uh, certain deficiencies in the male uh, toolbox. <laughs> yeah, I, I get that. Yeah, I understand. I, I had a lovely rhubarb patch, and uh, you're making me wistful for rhubarb right now, and a whole series of thought patterns yeah, that man. are coming out of it. <laughs> so, so hey, listen, before we get to before we get too far into this, I mean, we're 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 gonna start to wrap it up soon, but I want to make sure you get out your particulars. Uh, tell us some of the names of your books and where can people find you. Do you tweet? Oh, you have I, a Twitter handle? Sure. Uh, they can get me on Twitter at my name, Warren Bobro, with a number one because someone stole my name, so I had to put a one in front of it. Oh. Long story. Um, I'm on LinkedIn under my own name. I think Facebook is Bobro. Um, Instagram, of course, just my name, how it should be, uh, Warren Bobro. Um, I have five or six books. Let's see. I have Apothecary Cocktails that came out 2013. Whiskey cocktails, bitters and shrub syrup cocktails, cannabis cocktails. Um, my fifth book came out May of 2017, The Craft Cocktail Compendium. And I have a sixth cookbook in France, uh, Apothecary Cocktails Translated into French. And then I believe there's another one that Barnes Noble uh, requisitioned. It's a remake of whiskey cocktails. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's just for, Bar- just for Barnes and Noble. Okay, that's in reprint. Yeah, that's neat. So that's amazing. You've that's got all these books. This is so you're basically writing a book a year at this point. Uh, yeah, and one of them two two books in the first year. Uh, I did a, I did whiskey cocktails and bitters and shrub in one year. I'll uh-huh. never do that again. That was absolutely crazy. Those books are 160 thousand words a piece, and I wrote them in one month. I was only given a month. Wow. So that's something you should know. You know, publishing is not a glamorous art. Um, no one gets rich in publishing. I, I wish that my publisher had told me uh, more clearly. Maybe she did. Maybe she didn't. But uh, the fact is, no one gets rich in being a published, you know, being an author. What it leads to are great things. And I certainly had the personality for it to become something that was more than just uh, writing books. Yeah. You know, it, it took me to the next step in my life. And the Cannabis Cocktails book has made me a star. I mean, I, I never saw it coming. I'm famous in, in uh, certainly in craft cocktails, but I never thought I'd be famous in cannabis. And I'm so I'm just thrilled to be famous in cannabis because it, it helps me be the more authentic Warren. You know, in liquor, I was always stumbling with it because I don't like getting drunk. But in, in weed, you know, I could smoke just kind of went under the table with without much trouble right and uh and it's fun for me <laughs> so, <laughs> it sounds know, like it's, fun. it's not it's not stressful 
and there's no there are no hangovers and there are no there's none of the the downtime that that I had with liquor and and you know I I go down to events like Hales of the Cocktail in New Orleans and you know my, my wife would be pained to hear this but but it's always true you know you, you, one drink or five drinks all it takes is one to go over the edge and that means one or two days sitting in bed throwing up in New Orleans yeah, because yeah. it's so humid. There. Sure. You know, it's so hot and humid, you don't want to have any alcohol in you. It's bad. So uh, I'm really careful about it now. And uh, I don't want those experiences. They make me, they take away too much time that I don't have. So you're not, you you don't drink any alcohol now at all? Or, uh, I, hardly. I, I, I mean, I love wine. I, well, you know, I still write about wine and I love wine. I very rarely work at beer, but I absolutely adore beer, but I don't drink as much of it as I li- would like to because, of course, it's liquid bread, and it all goes to my belly. Right. Um, I very rarely drink high- hard spirits. Um, it, I can tell you how many drinks I've had since last year's Tales of the Cocktail on, on both hands, maybe eight in the last year. Okay. That's it. Um, I just don't have a, a, a palate for it anymore. I do tasting notes for a barrel whiskey, and you know that that I'm able to do. But I don't necessarily find myself going out to a bar to have drinks with friends. I'm right. not comfortable doing that, and it, it doesn't do anything for me. But All you that can I do really it though. Want to do is, you can do it as a mixologist, well, though. You can throw down anything. Well, yeah, right? I mean, but I, I don't have I don't have to drink to be a mixologist. No, of course not. Yeah, I know what the thing is taste like, and and. You know, and then the other side of it is I'm trained as a saucier, so I, I know flavor. You know, flavor comes easily to me. What's, and I what, want to what's that? You're trained as a what? A, a voicier? Saucier, soup stock, oh, oh. soup stocks and sauces. Right. A saucier. A saucier. Oh, okay. You know, I, I went to, sure. Yeah, I did the culinary school, and, and I went, I worked in France, and, you know, I, I know about flavor. So nice. I want to just be, you know, as I said, I want to be very crisp and knowing that I have a trained palate. Yeah. And my palate was, was nurtured and educated growing up on a farm that's organic and biodynamic. And I, as I said earlier in the, you know, in the interview, I had a very privileged upbringing. And the food was the best food the money can buy. And whenever we traveled to Europe, we were not eating in hotel rooms. Yeah. So, at, you know, we would go three or four or five times a year, and it was always the very best. So I have to just be very, you know, very strict and, and say that uh, I wasn't, I didn't grow up eating fast food and I don't drink, you know, eat it today and I don't drink, you know, soda or anything like that. Right. And I'm really just careful and cognizant of my life and I try to, you know, be be peaceful and, and live a life of, of wellness and my drinks, you know, certainly are strong, but I, but I will say that they have a positive bend to them as well. Yeah. Well, I was, I was born on a farm too. So, you know, it was a wind farm, though. I got in trouble all the time because when, yeah. Yeah, when my mom called me, I couldn't hear her because the frequency would get absorbed by the blades. That's another story. Anyway, <laughs> she, uh, I, 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 have to, I have to spend a little bit of time just before we get going on. Um, I want to get your thoughts. I, I understand where you're at. I think I really do understand where you're at, where your palate is and where your mind is regarding um, alcohol. I think it's fascinating that it, yeah. it, it seems to me that you were right in there and you've kind of migrated across the divide, spent some time in 50-50 right. land, and now you're far more into the infused uh, cannabis version of things than the alcohol version of things. Is that fair to say? That's absolutely so. And I'm and I'm proud to, to, to be that person and, and to be able to harness that energy because as I said, my my contribution to the alcohol world through using cannabis is not so far off the mark historically. Yeah. So all that I can say is that I try to take ideas that were from another another century and reinvent them using modern techniques and modern ingredients wow that's incredible so now this sets up the my final question for you (laughs) so very well i just kind of want to save the moment (laughs) but uh regarding everything you just said what are your thoughts uh and and what kind of things have you spent time thinking about regarding absinthe 
This is another mind-altering oh, substance that oh is an God. alcoholic no, beverage. No, it's not. It's not my. It's it's not mind-altering at all. There's what is it? Nothing in absinthe which is mind-altering. Uh, altering. There's more of the thuja, which is perceived as mind-altering, in onions and orange juice than there is in absinthe. Wow. So, so that's completely off mark. It's totally off mark. Absinthe is, is, is literally innocuous. Um, the only thing in absinthe that I really worry about is the high alcohol, but I don't worry about anything else. Could there's be nothing, there's nothing in it. It doesn't yeah, it doesn't matter at all. Wormwood is not is is, is innocuous and uh Dujon is innocuous and I just I, I get really worked up about that because it's a bad boy, certainly but it's not bad boy because of the herbs. It's bad boy because of the alcohol. And that's why. There's wow. nothing in absinthe that's going to hurt you in any way. As I said, the uh, the active ingredient, quote, unquote, in absinthe is something called fujon, and there's more of it in an onion and more of it in orange juice. And, and your Thanksgiving turkey has more than than absinthe. It was, it was invented. The, the poisonous aspect was invented by the French Wine Council, because absinthe drinking was cutting into the wine sales, oh. so they had to vilify it. What, what did you say they, the name they, of the I've, substance I've was? I've seen in this there? in France, so I know. What did you say the the, the main substance that's more in onions uh, is? It's it, called thujone. It's T H U J O N E. Oh, thujone. Wow. Huh. Okay. And that's 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 derived from wormwood. Right. And wow. wormwood is in, you know, like Angostura bitters has a ton of wormwood in it. And gin, you know, wormwood sometimes is one of the botanicals in gin. And, right. you know, it just goes on and on. All the different all the different things that wormwood is in that you wouldn't even know it. And you wouldn't even, you know, you'd be like, oh, wormwood. Hey, that's great. You know, wormwood. Yeah. Well, wormwood was originally found to kill, you know, stomach worms. That's what it was for. Right. You know, people, there wasn't great refrigeration, so, you know, the food that they ate gave them worms, and if you took wormwood, you, you were able to rid your body of, of that, you know, of, of that ailment. That's incredible. Well, I'm certainly so, glad I asked you, you know, about it. That's amazing. Yeah, I am too. So I worked with a guy named Ted Bro, who does uh, Lucid Absinthe he, and, a, and a number of other ones uh, that are just incredibly high-quality absinthe, and they're extraordinarily expensive and so i infused them with uh with thc and oh. made things like absinthe frappes which are pretty amazing wow kind I'm of not... like a mojito but with absinthe that's incredible i'm gonna have to look into that uh see i've never had it i've never had it here uh, when i say here i mean in north america i've been told you can't yeah, even yeah. get the real stuff here anyway so i've never tried yeah, it no you can you can no that's not true that's another lie <laughs> so, so there so is the absence that you get in the United States or Canada is the exact same absence that you get in Europe. There's no difference. Wow. Huh. Okay. Well, that's going to be of no, interest there's, too. There's no difference. There's no difference at all. In fact, um, the ones that you want to kind of stay away from are the ones that are the shocking colors. Like La Fiverre is the you know the fluorescent green one. Right. You can get that in Nova Scotia. I know. I mean, because, you know. Huh. I know you can buy it up in Canada. Wow. Um, it's absolutely the same liquid as, as come from, comes from France or Switzerland. I would steer clear of the ones from like Czechoslovakia. They tend to be poorly made. <laughs> um, you know, Switzerland, there is some good ones from Switzerland. France probably has the best. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, it, there's, it's all, it's all a matter of taste, but if it has a, a, a bright color of the liquid, Steer away from Stay it because away. that's artificial color. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, what's next? And up if you're your... infusing, of course, you're heating. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's okay. What What's next up for you? What's your next big event? I mean, we barely got to you uh, pin down here. Uh, next the... big event. Yeah. Next Next big event is Tales of the Cocktail down in New Orleans. And I think this is going to be my last year. I'm tired of being dissed for a spirited award. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not represented by PR, so I don't have, the, you know, the big money spend that everyone has. And I don't use ghostwriters like so many of the books are ghostwritten right. and that have been nominated and have actually won awards. You know, ghostwritten of books, I, I just don't get it. I mean, I, I, I write for a living, so I can't understand paying someone else to write for me. But, you know, go figure. 
What what is um, the uh, what's so this award you're not winning? The, the award is the Spirited Award at Tales of the Cocktail for the best cocktail book. Oh, okay. And I've been dissed for the. I was nominated in 2013, and that was the last time I heard from that. Book. <laughs> so, oh gosh. Yeah. And, well, and you know, and my books are are, are truly bestsellers. I mean, they sell I they sell thousands and thousands of copies. And more than anyone else, I just don't get it. But that's okay. I don't have to be liked by everyone, and I certainly don't have to, uh, you know, win win any awards to be part of the club because I don't want to be part of the club. I'm already, you know, when I work with weed, that that changed everything in, in alcohol. You're so what they used to call, to, to just, you know, a maverick. That's what they used to call people like you. I, I am absolutely a maverick, but you know, and I'm also just I'm just doing what I love and what I'm passionate about. And following my dreams, and hopefully I don't go bankrupt again. And you know, I'm just I'm living my life as I see fit. Well, my, I hope that my pathway crosses yours at some point because uh, I, I meet so many fantastic people in this uh, industry and in, in this uh, series of realizations. I sure would like to get a chance to uh, have an evening with Warren Bobro's uh, <laughs> whatever's in your mind that day. It would be so great. Oh my gosh, that would be so. I'd be so honored. You know, I mean, I, I, they say I have a great face for radio, but I really would love to meet you in person, so I have a chance to clasp your hand and uh, and say you aren't wrong by having me on your show. Ah, uh, well, thanks very much. We, you, you don't need promotion. You've got your own self promotion. It's Warren Bobro, folks. I have, you have to. He's the mixologist of all things cannabis, and uh, he knows the whole mess. So get onto his page. Get onto Amazon. That's all it was, just a rotten nightmare. Now we know the real stuff, so uh, check them out all over the place. Everything is going to be fine. I really so, appreciate it. So glad you came on, and we're looking forward to. Uh, I'm going to get Kim set up for the task. We've got we've got some American trip to make. We'll have to we'll have to hook up with you somehow. But I'm so looking forward to it, Warren. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's my pleasure, my brother. I can't wait to meet you. All right, you too. Be well and travel safely. Cheers. Thank you. That's Warren Bobro, everybody. Fantastic. Now uh, uh, he is, uh, I don't know where exactly where, where his next thing is going to be, but uh, imagine just bringing forth everything you like about yourself, taking your own skill set. This guy was a mixologist of all things booze. And once you learn a certain amount of that stuff, you're you're gonna have to, uh, and then apply it to cannabis. You know, that's your skill set that you're bringing to your different existence, which is kind of uh, kind of interesting. But uh, for now, let's do a little commercial commercial here. Uh, we have to do this. I've got good news. Check out our producer, Kim Sakamoto. You probably heard me refer to Kim on and off the show several times. Kim is uh, featured on a new podcast on Podbean called Your Highness Podcast. It's called the Your Highness Podcast. Hosts Diana and, uh, well, it's a one host, sorry. Uh, Diana and Kim discuss the challenges of being a content creator in the cannabis space, whatever that means. Oh, yeah, this is content right now. So she produces my show. And does uh, uh, the uh, social media aspect of presenting it to the world as well. She's very good at it. It became evident that uh, we weren't going to be able to keep her only to ourselves. And Kim has gone off and formed uh, her new business, K-Star Marketing and PR. So this is a good commercial for me because this is a commercial where I can, you know, I actually uh, endorse and use the product being mentioned. Which I have so far done with every every sponsor that has uh, had anything to do with the show at this point. But do check this out once again. Your Highness podcast on Podbean, and uh, yeah, that's what that is. So uh, we can understand that uh, that is available online and forever, like so many of these. Now we're we're just tucking into the final chunk of the show. I'm still having my head blown about absinthe. Listen to this article. I can't read the whole thing because it's so long, but I'm going to read some of it because it's so great. Uh, This is from policyalternatives.ca. 
Now, this, this is uh, regarding Canada's new cannabis system, and I know there are a lot of people around the world listening in to us to find out what it is we're doing. A lot of people think it's great, but there are uh, certainly some drawbacks here. So, uh, written by uh, this uh, person, John Akpata. Okay, so um, he's, it says, A long-time marijuana activist tries to make sense of Canada's new cannabis capitalism. I find myself poised between astonishment and outrage at the miserable marijuana monstrosity that's been bred by the Trudeau government and sold to doting Canadians as, quote, legalization. You might think that legalization without decriminalization is paradoxical, that one cannot exist without the other. You might believe that law is based on logic and facts. My skeptical nature had me anticipating that legalization actually meant financialization. That is, a regulated framework of legal and financial engineering that would create a new series of aristocrats. The Canadian Marijuana Entrepreneur. My healthy distrust of government had me predicting that legalization would also continue to oppress and criminalize minorities and the poor. Two years ago, I speculated it's going to get worse before it gets better, and now bills C-45 and C-46 are slouching towards Ottawa to be born. Well, they're already going through. Of course, this was written on March 1st. So they're, they're going through and they've made changes. Uh, the senators have made changes. The government rejected uh, 14 or 15 of those or so. Send it back to the Senate. It's bouncing around like a ping pong ball and making just as much sense. Trajectory-wise. This fellow has been a member of the Marijuana Party since 2004, has run in the last five federal elections, and currently is a peace officer for the party. I've had to consistently deconstruct the flawed thinking of reefer madness. I've had to face the medusa of racism that hides in the history of Emily Murphy. I've had the slings and arrows of every Cheech and Chong joke. I've smiled at every Jimi Hendrix or Bob Marley reference. I've risked my personal and professional reputation by aligning myself with something that was thought to be immoral, dangerous, and criminal. The members of the Marijuana Party have been unified by one common ideology, cannabis, should not be criminalized. Of course, we have a lot of police officers here that feel the other way around. Of course, a lot of those police officers are deeply invested into the companies that will be strictly and licensed producers selling this stuff. In order to defend this position, that cannabis should not be criminalized, I've had to study botany, science, and the policies of Health Canada and Veterans Affairs Canada and the law. I am now, as I have always been, in a bit of a haze at the reasoning of it all. So here's a well-studied man in a lot of different aspects. Still can't make sense of it. Uh, that is uh, makes me feel better. Uh, having marijuana or cannabis included in the schedule of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act and enforcing that with the criminal code is outrageous. It is non-logical. It defies the laws of nature, science, and the will of the people. I think this guy's been listening to my show. Uh, no, I'm not going to say that. I, I, it's just that I have said all of these things so many times. Of course, that's why this article caught my eye. I'm not the only one saying these things. I'm just the only one saying it on this show. Marijuana prohibition is a monster roaming the countryside that kicks indoors and takes property away. Takes children away from their parents. Yeah. Got a big furor kicking around the states about that right now, but we've we've already got lots of policies, and Canada's already had lots of policies where children get taken away from their parents. Now they're acting like Trump's the first guy to ever do it. Handcuffs people and saddles them with a criminal record. Did I jump in there quick enough? It's it's it does the policies. Oh yeah, handcuffs the people and saddles them with a criminal record. Humans become outcasts before they can apply for a pardon or a record suspension, as it's now called. Yet Bill C forty five is creating a monopoly for the rich, and Bill C forty six will let the police continue to beat down the poor. So I'm going to read some more of this next week. Uh, this great article, if you don't want to wait for that, um, go to uh, policyalternatives.ca. Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives is what that means. And have, have this article uh, at your desktop or your phone, March 1st, 2018. And the title is, 
A longtime marijuana activist tries to make sense of Canada's new cannabis capitalism. That's John Akpata doing that. And a great article. Fantastic. Very well written um, for sure. So um, just on the way out, I will say that uh, I'm very glad that Warren Bobro was on the show tonight. Thank you very much. We are uh, bringing on some uh, guests we've had on before trying to line that up we had one lined up and he had a brexit emergency session over there in england paul paul flynn the uh, parliamentarian from the labor party and regardless of your take on government he is in the government and uh, he had, he does have lots to say that's really refreshing and wonderful about cannabis but next week next week we have a fantastic show and uh, we always have a fantastic show because I learn something every single week and I'm, I'm always in here, you know, doing it. But uh, I, I'm very excited about next week's episode. Next week is going to embrace things of a comedic nature to do with cannabis. Raise your fists any way we can. So we'll see you next week on Green Crush Conspiracy Queries with... Alan Park as the uh, the Clydesdale train of horses bringing in the hope and understanding of the cannabis world is at hand folks and we will see you next week as it brings in even more information this is Alan Park Green Crush Conspiracy Queries out